Do you know what the most important variable is to a perfect fly cast? We've had many fly casting related episodes over the years, but today is extra special. That's because we have the person who is credited to removing the mystery behind fly casting. He has created a method that allows you to understand where your cast needs help and how to fix it so you have much more success and fun on the water this year. This is the Wet Fly Swing Podcast where I show you the best places to travel to for fly fishing, how to find the best resources and tools to prepare for that big trip, and what you can do to give back to the fish species we all love. Hey, how's it going? I'm Dave, host of the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. I've been fly fishing since I was a little kid. I grew up around a little fly shop and have created one of the largest fly fishing podcasts in this country. I've also interviewed more of the greatest fly anglers and casting instructors than just about anyone out there. Bill Gamble, creator of the Five Essentials of Fly Casting, a structure that many experts have highlighted as one of the most important frameworks in fly casting. Today, you're going to find out how dropping your right foot is going to help your timing, what the number one most important variable is to a fly cast, and also the number one drill that you can do today to level up your fly cast. We're going to get you back on track today. Let's get some line speed and loop control going. Here he is, Bill Gamble. How you doing, Bill? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for uh, setting some time aside here. Um, you know, you are your name is well known in fly casting instruction, the five essentials of fly casting, which we're going to touch on today. Um, I think I most recently maybe heard more about you from uh, Paul Arden at Sexy Loops, uh, but we also recently had on uh, Bruce Richards who was talking about, you know, it seems like we're in a fly casting section, but I know you know all those guys, but we're going to talk about you know, really help people understand their fly cast, maybe get better at fly casting, then hear your history because a lot of people attribute a lot of the improvements to you, you know, in, in the fly cast. But before we get there, take us back to fly fishing. How did you first get into it? And then maybe talk about your dad and the influence there. Sure. Well, I probably uh, started catching bluegill on the fly rod when I was probably six or seven years old. My older brother and my father were both fly fishing at that time, and it was just kind of a natural thing. Um, I um, actually fly fished my whole life until college when I did a master's degree doing a rod and reel studies on largemouth bass. And my major professor said, hey, you can't do that with a fly rod. You got to do it with a conventional tackle or there'll be no, you'll be the only person in this state that can benefit from your work if you do it with a fly rod. If you, And so I actually had to learn to conventional fish in college just to do my master's thesis uh, up until that time all i had done is fly fish and that's pretty rare from baytown texas hmm. um baytown is absolutely not the mecca of fly fishing say it that way it's not but my dad um he started in the early 60s probably mid 60s and um he was a um probably one of the early fly fishermen on the texas coast for sure the upper coast and um, he didn't even know the concept of pulling in real shallow water and looking for tailing fish. He just um, was using a fly rod right next to the conventional tackle guy and was catching trout and redfish um, on his fly rod very early on. And that just kind of transitioned into my brother and I both being fly fishermen. And my father was a college professor he teaches at the same or he taught at the same college that i teach at today hmm. and um we would spend our summers out west in wyoming or montana and um that's something my family has kept going i just returned from southern colorado just about a week ago and um so we would spend the hot part of the summer july is a really good time to leave baytown texas and so um we would spend the late part of July, early part of August out west. And that kind of really fueled the fly fishing bug at that point, catching trout and going out to the Federation of Fly Fisher conclaves and stuff like that really kind of fueled the bug. Yeah. Wow. Basically, your entire life, your dad was a huge influence. And I want to hear more about your dad here in a minute. I'll just take it back to, so Baytown and why, describe that. Are you still in that area and uh, maybe talk yeah. about, yeah. Yes, I live in the same town that I grew up in. We're in Houston. This is the area that my dad was from, and he could come back here. He knew out of college um, he could come back here and get a job. And so the family has just stayed here, and the really good hunting and fishing in this area. 
it's just not as conducive to fly fishing. Um, we live on Trinity Bay, and uh, the Trinity River comes out of Dallas, runs through East Texas, and it picks up a great deal of um, uh, basically a heavy silt load. So the water is not that gin clear, crystal clear water that you see down in South Texas. Yeah. When we sight fish, it is hard to actually see the fish. It, it can be done, and at times it's really good, but a lot of time you're looking for that tail or you're casting to a wake. You're not actually looking into the water and seeing an entire redfish there. You're just seeing a change in the shade of the water or you're seeing a, just a flick of a tail or maybe a real heavy head wake, something like that that you can cast to. Uh, it's, it's not the classic sight cast that you hear about. You know, I actually started out, uh, and this was kind of drove the whole casting thing, was um, we'd be waist deep in water blind casting. And um, we'd stand at the mouth of a bi little bio or gut that would empty into the bay on a falling tide. You could stand there on a falling tide and you'd catch a speckled trout if you worked your fly real fast. Hmm. And then if you worked it slower and let it bounce on the bottom, you'd pick up a redfish or a flounder. And there'd be all three species of fish right there at the mouth of that bio feeding on the outgoing tide. But it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't the classic pulling a boat or waiting. Yeah, but you caught some fish. It got us hooked in it. And um, it's just kind of blown up from there. And um, now I own a polling skiff and and have realized that there's actually a lot more sight fishing available here than we ever knew at the start. Oh, right, right, right. Awesome. Well, this is good. I think we'll talk more about, you know, your home waters as we get going here. But, yeah, I want to hear a little bit about your dad. I know he was a big influence on, you know, on you. And, I mean, everybody, I think, knows people that have heard your name. I think they, the five essentials of fly casting. But maybe talk about that. What was your dad's influence on your life? And was the five essentials, did that come from something your dad uh, taught you? Uh, no, he and I learned it together. Um, my father was a very good athlete. And had really good hand-eye coordination, and he learned to fly cast out of sheer ability, not knowledge, and um, he could copy what he saw. That served him well. He caught lots of fish and had a lot of fun and really enjoyed it, but then as I came along, the bluegill fishing was great, but then as I wanted to start in the saltwater fishing, he knew I needed to be able to add a little more distance to what I could already do, and a little more power casting for handling the wind and that kind of thing. He had no idea how to teach me. I mean, he knew what he was doing and he knew what some of the experts were doing, but he didn't really understand it. I needed some help. And so he and I kind of set out together to understand it. I was old enough. I was in the 13, 14 year old range. I was old enough, smart enough to kind of understand what was going on. And so he and I set out together to try to learn to fly cast the right way. And uh, in that day and time in Baytown, you know, there was a, a fly shop in Houston, uh, a man named Brooks Bolden uh, owned the Angler's Edge. And um, there was also an Orbis store in Houston, and Dave Hayward ran that. Those two men were both really good about bringing in casting experts of the time and this is 1980s so it was lefty cray mel krieger steve ray jeff those guys all came to houston to give demonstrations and come away with a lot of answers to questions but we'd also in, end up having 15 more questions than we had answers what we realized was a lot of the casters in that time period they were teaching you how they did it it was very style oriented and um, we realized that all of them had their own signature style. And some of the differences in the styles confused us. And my dad had the ability to really visualize it. And um, I was struggling. So he went and bought a home video camera. And we made it an effort for the next couple of years to just travel around and get as much footage of great fly casters as we could get. Then we would literally come home and watch it like football film <laughs> and, you know, put it on slow motion, freeze frame, whatever we could do 
to figure out how the fly cast worked and um and we were you know picking up stuff from everywhere i tell people all the time that my father and i did not invent the five essentials yeah what we did was we put them together as five things um we did not discover anything we just were enough of a student of the fly cast to realize hey this statement that this man made and this statement that this lady over here made they go together and here are basically the five things that everybody does the same it could have been just as easy the five common threads of fly casting yep so basically you guys out of your own need, um, you, you developed these five essentials basically to help clarify because you had people like Lefty and all these famous people who had their own styles, but it was hard for you guys to understand, you know, basically the essence, right, of what they were. So did you, and it took a few years to get those out. Once you figured out the five, how did you share it to the world or did that happen right away? So it was not really quick, but I was 14, 15 years old when I started teaching fly casting lessons and I kind of had a feeling for the five essentials. I didn't teach them exactly the way I do now, but, um, I was teaching lessons for Brooks Bolden in Houston when I was 15 years old. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting to go to a fly casting lesson with six 40 year old men and you drive up and your mother lets you out of the car. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting situation. Right. But, uh, about that time, uh, there was a lady here from Baytown. It was, it's kind of amazing how much fly fishing has run through Baytown, Texas to be such a out of the way place. But the lady who was in charge of the education department for the FFF taught at the same college with my dad. And she was tasked with putting together multiple little 25 page booklets on fly fishing. And she had a intro to fly fishing she had an intro to fly tying she had an intro to this and that i think there was an entomology book at one time well she asked my dad and i to write the 25 page fly casting book and dad and i kind of saw it as an opportunity to do something for fly casting or for the fff and we spent two years writing 25 pages and we just poured over that video collection that we had. We went and got more video. About that time, I graduated from high school. My parents flew me out to um, San Francisco, and a man named Chris Corich, uh, uh, who was a big tournament caster, friends with the Ray Jeff brothers, kind of grew up in that circle, and really a great tournament caster. He gave me the only fly casting lesson I've ever had, mm. and it was supposed to be several days, a couple hours a day, and it turned into about 15 hours one day. And um, we got most of that on videotape. And so Dad and I came and poured over that, and then we finished up the essentials. Um, and I think the first edition came out in the summer of 88, uh, maybe 89. And then there were a couple of mistakes that got past us and we asked to do a second edition. What everybody knows now is the Five Essentials booklet is the, actually the second edition. Uh, we went in and cleaned up a couple of the things that got past us in the editing process. And um, then that booklet came out about the time the instructor program was really getting off the ground. And um, those two things together kind of catapulted it. The Federation, the casting board, saw the value of the Five Essentials booklet and concept of, hey, this is more of a physics-based model than a style model. Mm -hmm. That will get rid of all the infighting and the ego, all that, that can stop a group. If we all get behind the Five Essentials. We can all still teach our own personal style, but we have a basis to talk you know, we, we all have a center point to talk from if we use the essentials. Yeah. Well, everybody agreed, everybody seemed to agree to that and it took off from there. And that's kind of how the essentials came to be. Did it feel like once you guys finished those and that was published, um, you know, first, how did that feel? And did you feel like, you know, you had all these people, Lefty Cray, all these people with the FFF, 
did you feel like you were in amongst giants and with this thing that everybody was using or how did it feel when it actually first published? Well, I did feel like I was in among giants. You know, Mel Krieger was very, very kind to me and very, very helpful. Um, he just been over backwards to be our friend. And, um, a lot of the people in the FFF were very, very helpful. And it's not always the names that you think, um, we would go to the FFF conclaves and we'd spend our whole day with the rod in our hand casting. And, um, there were guys coming to that FFF conclave that people had never really, you know, let's say the vast majority of people had never heard of, but they were really, really good casting instructors. Um, there was an older man there. His name was Alan Rohr, California. But he would spend his uh, summers on Henry's Lake, just outside West Yellowstone. And um, Alan helped me a great deal. He would see me out there practicing and casting and come up. And um, I remember I was so glad I didn't make a teenager smart aleck comment to him. <laughs> but I was practicing um, accuracy casting, shooting at rings on the casting pond. He walks up and he asked me, what am I aiming at? And... You know, when you're 17, 18 years old, that kind of question leads you right into, you know, a smart aleck comment <laughs> if, yeah. you're, if you watch your mouth. But I said, well, I'm, I'm aiming at those white rings right there. He said, are you hitting them? And I said, well, yes, sir, some of the time. He said, well, I want you to do something. You have really good form. Your, your uh, mechanics are really good, but you're only hitting a 30-inch ring some of the time. I want you to look through the ring, pick out a pebble on the bottom of the pond that's in the center of the ring. And I want you to hit that pebble. So I started shooting at the pebble in the middle of the ring. And then he said, how many times have you hit the ring? And I said, I hit the ring every time. <laughs> and so he said, you need to focus. And, you know, it's kind of the old rifle, uh, aim small, miss small. Um, he said, you need to direct your concentration to a pinpoint and then your, your accuracy will get 10 times better than what you're currently doing. And that helped me a great deal. And, um, I, I've always remembered that and always been thankful. I didn't mouth off to him because he was really giving me great information. Yeah. Who is that person? That was Alan Rohr. Yeah. Alan Rohr. I think Alan was from the Long Beach casting club in Southern California. Then uh, another guy who just, I've never met this man since. I remember his name and I, uh, I have followed him on the Instagram a little bit and I just kind of generally know who he is, but this man spent a couple of hours with me teaching me the distance cast and his name was John Vanderhoof and he happened to be a, a tournament caster off the West coast. And he just saw me over there one day and this was a different year than the year with Alan, but he would just walk up and start talking to me and he said, well, try this and try that. And, and he worked with me for a couple of hours and really improved my distance casting. And I bring that up and that with so much knowledge and such a good, uh, attitude about sharing their knowledge, people who didn't have big egos, you know, they weren't the superstars at that event. They were just people there that came to learn and share and, you know, just be part of the group. And it was invaluable to me. Yeah. Wow. So I kind of missed that about the FFF. I know it's the FFI now, but it'll always be the FFF to me. Right. But they've gone away from the conclave concept. Stonefly Nets, nestled in the heart of the Ozarks, Ethan, a master craftsman, dedicates his skill to creating the finest wood landing nets. Stonefly Nets are more than just nets. They are part of our story, each cast and every cast. Ready to make your fly fishing trips unforgettable? Visit StoneflyNets.com and discover the difference of a handcrafted wood landing net. Want to experience a magic trick? On a certain river, at a certain time of day, time slows down. Where is this place? Located in the heart of Montana is a place where people go to slow things down, to float down a historic river, and to watch the birds dance across the sky. Watch animals explore the open land and, of course, to fish. If you're looking to slow things down, Helena, Montana is waiting for you.
Visit Helena, Montana right now. You can head over to HelenaMT.com to get a change of pace this year. So you mentioned, you know, a couple of things that we haven't even dug into the five essentials. We will talk to that in a little bit, but you mentioned in, uh, the person there helping you increase your distance casting. How did he do that? And what would be your tips to help somebody listening now to increase, you know, their, their casting distance? Well, one of the things that he, um, he taught me was about trajectory. Mm. I was envisioning a iconic picture on the page of one of Mel Krieger's books, The Essence of Fly Casting, where he's got this long amount of line laid out, and he's really throwing it at a really high forward trajectory. And at the time, I was throwing a shooting head. And um, he said that he thought I was throwing it too high. He said, that's great if you're shooting a a rifle and you're trying to make a really long, long rifle shot. You would have to aim well above your target. But a fly cast is only going to go so far. You want to direct the power or the force of the cast doesn't need to spend so much time going up. Um, so, yes, it needs to be above flat. But I was many degrees above flat. I was really casting it up. He said, cast more flat and your line speed, get that loop as far out there as possible before it hits the ground. Don't spend so much energy trying to climb the hill. Just get over there as fast as possible. Yeah. That kind of stuck in my head for a while. And I, and I, um, I really knew he was pretty right on that. And it, actually makes more sense when casting a full fly line than it does with a shooting hit that you can actually get away with more trajectory with the shooting hit in, in my experience but um later when i went to uh, that lesson with chris courage um it's another opportunity that i could have run my mouth and didn't <laughs> but um he had worked with me all day and um He's very animated and very fun to be around. And he's just jumping up and down. You got it. You got it. And I had thrown a cast maybe in the hundred thirties, maybe low one forties. And he had just thrown one out there about 160 feet, Jeez. but he's over there jumping up and down saying, you got it. You got it. That was perfect. And I said something along the lines of, you know, don't tell me that's perfect. I'm 25 feet short of where you just landed. How do I get there? <laughs> and he said, you have to go home. And you have to learn to go from right here. And he put his hand in the back cast position to right here. And he put his hand in the front cast position. He said, you have to go from right here to right here faster. And um, so line speed and loop control are the two foundations of distance casting. When you start talking with Paul about throwing a five-weight fly line 125 feet, there's some other things that go into it. Yep. The average fly fisherman is talking about throwing a full fly line, which is about 100 feet. That's what's considered distance. Is Can I throw the whole fly line? Well, loop control and line speed will absolutely throw a full fly line. Uh, if you got those two things down, the distance will come. Yeah. That's kind of the basis of it. Yes, there's many little little things that we could talk all day on the techniques of distance casting, but those two things, what you need to focus on first. Okay. Perfect. So that, no, that makes sense. Basically line speed and loop control, and we can follow up with you. I'm sure, you know, you have some resources out. I mean, I guess if somebody did want to follow, let's just start there, follow up more on how to get a longer cast. Where would you send them? What, do you have resources online or what's your recommendation? Um, Probably the best online resource there is is Paul Arden's Sexy Loops yeah. page. Um, I have articles there. Um, there's just a ton of material on distance casting. That's probably one of the best resources. Uh, if you go to their discussion board, you have to kind of wade through lots of pages of discussion. But he has articles. He has videos. He has all kinds of resources there. Uh, that's probably the best one-stop shop. Yep. Um I don't have any distance casting material online. I have um, a YouTube page that has the five essentials explained. 
And there's one playlist with the five essentials. There's another playlist that outlines a step-by-step method on how to teach yourself to cast. But it's all based on very basic how to make an overhead cast. Um, As far as any type of um, advanced casting, the Sexy Loops page is um, a really good resource. I know you did a podcast, Paul, a few weeks ago. Yeah, that's a really good resource. That's it. Okay, and we'll put a link out to that podcast we did with Paul, which was great. He's got a real unique uh, story, and he's on the other side of the world, you know, fishing for uh, snakeheads. So it's, it was a pretty awesome uh, episode. But well, let's jump into the five essentials real quick, and maybe we'll just do it high level because I know you do have the videos and uh, online. But maybe talk about that. What are these five essentials, and how can somebody maybe use these to uh, have a better cast, more accurate cast, you know, that sort of stuff? Okay. Well. Um, after 20 years of teaching the five essentials, um, I realized that what my dad and I had written in the book was literally just a list of the five essentials. 20 years later, I understood more how they actually worked. And so I changed the order to make better sense. And I think since I've done that, it has become a better casting model than it was just a list of five things you got to accomplish. The original booklet had the straight line path of the rod tip being the third essential. And I now teach that as the A number one, the most important thing to make an overhead U-shaped loop is a straight line path of the rod tip. Now that is very uh, obvious as an action, imagine a vertical plane. If I'm casting a circle around my body, I'm not casting a straight line path. No. And my my cast, will, I'll, I'll end up with a curved cast at the end of the presentation. So that's an action. You have to move the rod straight back and then straight forward. But the other plane is a horizontal plane. Well, that rod tip has to be straight in that plane also. And in order for that to happen, the other four essentials have to work together. So in one way, the straight line path is an action. The other way, the straight line path is a result. And so the other four essentials, having a variable casting stroke, having a variable pause or variable timing, having proper power application, and having no slack, those four things work together to keep that rod tip loading and unloading down a straight line path. And so um, the hardest part for everybody to really grasp is that variability. Yeah. And I want to talk to you about that later on. We, we you and I talked about it before the podcast yeah. about a drill that I've developed, but developing a truly variable casting arc. Short line, you're going to use a narrow arc. A longer line, you're going to use a wider arc. The shorter the line, the shorter the pause. The longer the line, the longer you have to wait for that line to straighten. So the longer pause, that's the second variable. And then um, power application. I know that that's really probably better said force, but my whole life I've used the term power and most people understand exactly what I mean by that, even though that might not be the the true physics term. But there is a wide variety of needs when it comes to adding force or power to that line. Uh, just the other day I was uh, side casting to some uh, big black drum in real shallow water. And these fish were more spooky than normal and i was throwing the very heavily weighted crab fly and if you put any power on that cast at all you were going to blow that fish off the flat completely and if you could land a heavily weighted crab fly delicately you were going to catch um or hook let's say it this way i didn't do a lot of good catching i had about a 25 percent landing rate on 45 pound black drum but if I could land that fly, I was in the game. If I hit the water too hard with that fly, I'd blow the fish out 
Um, so you really had to have a soft presentation. Later in the afternoon, the wind came up. The fish were a whole lot less spooky, but now you're having to deal with the wind. You have to add more line speed, add more power to the cast to overcome that wind. And so having the ability to to dial it back or add it if you need it is very helpful. So all three of those are are variables that you have to kind of develop. And then the slack makes sense. You're, yeah. it's, you're not be able to keep a load on the rod if you have slack in the line. Um, that's just come with practice, developing good technique of to not allow slack into the system. Yeah. Gotcha. So basically, yeah, and there's different online, you know, depending on which five essential, you know, who's writing it or who took your information, there's different numbering, but basically straight line path of the rod tip. So keep it straight. Uh, number two, the variable casting stroke. So if it's a long or, and is a casting stroke in arc, is that basically the same thing? Technically, no. Essentially, yes. Yeah. Uh, let me explain that if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, Ninety-nine percent of the world is going to widen their casting arc by lengthening their stroke. But technically, if you took your thumb and put it up, thumbs up position, you can move it from your shoulder all the way to arm extension with your thumb straight up. Well, you've just had a casting stroke with no arc. It's actually the angle through the which the arc travels that's the important part. Because I see um, trout fishermen who they don't do a lot of distance casting. They're throwing at very tight loops and have good line control, but they are very risky casters. They their arms very much. Whereas a saltwater fisherman using a lot of upper arm, a lot of forearm, and probably a lot of wrist also can get these really, really long stroke lengths. Yeah. What's the difference is they're both controlling the arc. So a narrow arc for a short cast, a medium arc for a medium cast, and a wide arc for a longer cast. I sent you a photograph or excuse me a a line drawing yeah that i got permission from paul to use Uh, hopefully you'll link that in your notes yeah and it's a line drawing of exactly what we're talking about a narrow arc is used when there's very little bend in the rod as you deepen the bend whether you're adding power or you've added line whatever you've done that deepens the bend of the rod you have to widen the casting arc in order to keep that rod tip traveling in a straight line. And then if you do something like shorten the line, which lessens the bend, then you have to narrow the arc. So if people would look at that drawing and think, what what have I done? Have I deepened the bend? Yes. Well, then I need to widen the arc. If I've lessened the bend, well, then I need to narrow the arc. That drawing will be a very good visual. And by bend, is that the, uh, increasing the bend, is that through the power application? Or how do you increase or decrease the bend of the rod? Okay, so you can absolutely adjust the bend using the power application. The more force that you apply, the deeper the bend's going to get. But you can also deepen the bend by lengthening the line. The more line that you have out past the rod, the more weight that's put on the rod when you come forward, that's going to deepen the bend. So they feel as though you're not really casting noticeably harder. So you may think that you haven't applied any extra power, but you put 20 feet of line out or 20 more feet of line. Well, that's a significant amount of weight added to the rod tip. So even though you haven't, you're not really feeling like you're casting a lot harder, you have to widen that arc in order to keep the rod tip traveling down the straight line. Mm, Gotcha. We'll put a link, like you said, the images. There's a uh, article called Making Adjustments on the Fly by Bill Gamble, and that's on Sexy Loops. So we'll put that article in there, and it has the uh, the image that you shared with me, and then there's the other, all five images. So we'll have that opportunity for people to take a look. Yes, sir. Awesome. So good. So basically, we talked variable, uh, the casting arc, and the stroke. 
and then the power application. And what about the timing? It seems like timing is also a tough thing. What do you tell somebody? How does somebody know whether their timing's off and maybe what they can do to get better timing? Well, essentially, the line needs to be straight in the back cast before you go forward in the front cast. Now, if you wait until it straightens, by the time you think now and actually get everything going forward, it will have fallen. Right. So I tell people to try to catch it just as it's, you know, you want to be going the other direction just as it straightens. Um, you don't want to see it straighten. Then it's falling while you try to get everything going the other way. Um, so you, you need to work on that timing to where you're catching the line just as it straightens, you're going the other direction. I teach the people to watch their cast at first, drop their right foot or drop their casting arm foot back. I'm right-handed, so it's my right foot. I drop back. Now I can look over my shoulder easier. I can watch my timing. That timing is going to vary with different lengths of line. It's obviously going to take 30 feet of line, less time to straighten than 60 feet of line. So you really kind of need to watch that at first. But then you um, you start to get a feel for it. You're not always going to feel the line straighten. Any type of wind or, you know, different variables can happen. Then you're not going to feel anything. But if you've done it enough, you'll know when to go. And yeah. I know that is a very difficult saying, but I'll talk to you about how many hours go into casting. Yeah. And I agreed with that statement. There's a lot of time goes into this to really develop a fully variable casting stroke. And it doesn't just come overnight. And it takes a lot of practice. And um, it's not anything hard. It just takes a, a little bit of dedication, 15, 20 minutes a night out in the yard, letting your neighbors make fun of you. <laughs> you know, give it that 15, 20 minutes a night. And it will come pretty quick. You'll be surprised how fast having a fully variable stroke will come to you. Yeah, that's it. Okay. And then um, and then maybe just kind of, we talked about these, but the power application and no slack. So these are other, I mean, these are all critical, but the power application, how does somebody understand, you know, when, how much power to put at what point, you know, maybe describe that a little bit. Okay. So over the years, I've, kind of come to the conclusion that can be summed up with one statement, a smooth acceleration to a stop. Dad and I used to try to explain it where, you know, the a certain percentage of the power is added at the first part of the cast with the majority of the power, power being added at the uh, last part of the cast. We had a graph that we like to show and that kind of thing. And it just makes, after years of working with that, I think it makes more sense to just, you're going to get a completely stopped rod, and then you're going to smoothly accelerate, which means the least amount of power is going to be at the first, medium amount of power in the middle, and the most amount of power at the end. Yep. So if you smoothly accelerate to a stop, I think that is the best way to describe yeah, it. It is. That is. And... Over the years, people have always tried to come up with... Um, yeah, the analogy, the perfect analogy for it. Yeah, and they've picked on it and said, hey, why isn't the stop the sixth essential? Oh, right. The stop, the stop is essential. And Jim Green told me one time, Jim had read my little book, and he said, hey, you and your dad wrote in 25 pages what many of us have tried to write in 300. That was an excellent book. And he quoted the page, whatever page, he said, you said you accelerate to a stop. He said, I think you should have said stop six or seven times right there. That stop is essential. Yeah, the stop is. But my dad and I, we totally agree with that, that the stop is essential. But it is the essential a part of power application. Because if you put power, if you're adding force in an acceleration then you accelerate forever and you've never actually put the energy into the line because the caster is accelerating the rod and the rod is accelerating the line. You got to stop accelerating the rod so that the rod can then energize the line. 
So it goes together. If you don't have the stop with power application, then you've never applied power. You're still accelerating. Yeah. And so um, the acceleration to a stop is the essential. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Waters West Fly Fishing Outfitters is your go-to resource for spay and swung fly techniques for the OP and beyond. They are known for their deep selection of unique high-quality fly tie materials, and they are the gateway to some of the great steelhead rivers in the country. I was able to get out on the water with Ed, and it was an amazing day. We uh, hit the shop early, met him at the shop. We fired up the old vehicle and headed out on the river. Ed is the type of guy that you feel comfortable right from uh, minute one. And it was a good day. We ended the trip uh, for buying into this unimproved boat ramp, uh, pulling the boat out, and then we ended up with a great opportunity uh, and landed a nice, very nice cromer and had a few other touches. Fished one of the great rivers in the country. It was amazing. Not only do they cover steelhead, but all species in the area, and they have a passion for all fish that swim up or live around salt. They can outfit any angler from the beginner to the most hardcore fishing bum you can imagine. They have a great online store, fast shipping, and uh, you will be supporting conservation when you support Waters Less. Please check in with Ed and Kyle right now to say hi and let them know you heard uh, from them on this podcast. And you can do that right now, wetflyswing.com slash waterswest. And this is the... The paintbrush analogy is something, you know, I think we've heard a lot about. Is that basically what this is, where you're trying to flick the paint off yep. of the paintbrush? The paint will never come off the paintbrush if you don't stop your hand. Yep. That's a really good visual for that. Kind of what I just said leads right into what Bruce is probably talking about. Bruce is uh, famous for his six-step analysis of a cast. What did the hand do to make the rod do something? Right. What did the rod do to the line? fix the line then you know here you just go from hand to rod to line and then from line back to rod back to hand and he really does a good job with that and um in that particular analogy you can't apply power without a stop yeah without a stop you got to have the stop so the stop like you said you didn't have it in the five but it is it is essential the stop it's part and really these are all work together like the no slack i mean no slack comes from, I guess, using all these first four things together, right? Like, is that, would you say anything right. else to slack? A slack is another challenging thing. How do you avoid that? You can add slack to a cast by not starting properly. But if you mess up your timing, you've added slack. If you mess up the power application to where it's not smooth, you've added slack. There's all sorts of things that add elements of slack it's not literally just having an s curve line on the water before you start if you think about it if you shock the rod in any way uh coming forward for a power application the result is going to be slack in the line and um so there's lots of ways that you can get slack if you let that line fall let's say your timing is too long or, or excuse me, your pause is too long, and you let the line straighten and begin to fall, there will be slack. So slack is not quite as obvious as the line needs to be straight before you start your cast. There's a lot of little spots you can insert slack into a cast, but you fix that by doing the other essentials correctly. So they all, they all tie together, and that's one of the most daunting tasks when I was a young casting instructor, I was so excited to have learned the five essentials. And now I want to teach everybody the five essentials. And I would go out and I would do a presentation of the five essentials before ever casting lesson. And my pupil was standing there just cross-eyed. Yep. <laughs> I had no idea what I was talking about. Yep. It was completely the wrong way to cast, the wrong way to teach. And over time, I learned that you kind of get them casting and you ease an essential in here or there as they mess them up. You know, they're all going to screw up their timing eventually. Everybody's going to struggle with power applications. Right. You just can't do something as variable as casting 
and not struggle with the variables every once in a while. And well, then that would, it, I would use that as my opportunity to tell them about that new essential that they just messed up. And then they learn so much better that way. Right. So you let them make some mistakes and see where they're making errors and then, then they could fix it and yeah. they can recognize it. And then it. go from there. Go and from there. There's just as much thought process goes into how to teach fly casting as there has been on how to um, actually do the fly cast. Yeah. That's a whole nother podcast. Yeah. Well, well let's uh, start to take it out of here with our listener uh, shout out segment. And I wanted to give a shout out from... Uh, uh, Hayden from South, uh, central PA. And he wanted me to give a shout out to, uh, Adams, uh, County TU chapter. And this today's, uh, shout out, listener shout out is presented by Togiak river lodge. We're going to be heading up there uh, in Alaska to fish for hopefully Kings, um, next year. And I've heard that's been, you know, it's one of the places you can still catch Kings, you know, in the Alaska area, they're, they're having some struggles up there, but maybe talk about that first before we get into a few takeaways here today. You know, I know you've done a lot of red fishing. Have you got around and had a chance? Is it, is trout your species of choice? Have you done anything else out there? Have any interest in chasing other fish, you know, whether that's salmon or musky or anything like that? Well, my fishing has been pretty reduced in the last few years, uh, to, just my summer trout fishing trip and local redfish and bass. I'm trained in school as a bass biologist, so I I spend a lot of time on private bass lakes and stuff like that. Dave, that's mainly because I have three kids. Yeah. And um, um, I stay pretty busy trying to, to go to all their different events and um, sporting games and stuff. And so I've kind of had to dial my fishing back some. Uh, to just family vacation and then local fishing. Uh, I guess if I had an opportunity to go and do a special trip, I'd be hard pressed between trying to go catch a big tarpon. Uh, I haven't done that in years. Uh, I did it when I was younger, and um, but they're calling my name again. <laughs> and I have never caught a permit on a fly. That is something that I'd like to go do. Now, Alaska, I've got a friend that, owns a fly-in camp constantly asking me to come fish with him and i i just so far up there that i um i don't see myself getting there and and then paul arden begs me to come oh right snakehead fishing with him but the chances of me getting to alaska are better than me going all the way across of malaysia yeah i know i know it's the same dilemma i think for all of us right I, we talk about this on the podcast a lot but you know, limited time and, you know, and you got to prioritize. And I think the cool thing is you've prioritized your family, you know, and I think that's really amazing that you've done that with your kids, you know, and, and are they, it sounds like, you know, maybe you have your older kid, uh, maybe he's, you know, kids go in and out, right, of the fishing, but are they excellent fly casters? Are they, are they better than you were at the same age? No, sir. No. My kids are very well-rounded young men. They have lots of different interests. Um, now, each one of them started fly fishing when they were about six. And um, each one of them has gotten to the point where I can give them a fly of the day box, uh, a spool, a tippet, and their rod and point to the river and say, you go that direction, I'm going this direction. Oh, that's awesome. I'll see you in a couple of hours and they can catch fish. <laughs> they are all self sufficient when it comes to fishing, but they've never loved it or not loved the casting part of it. They cast good enough. And um, the youngest one is actually probably the best caster because he's the one that's really gotten into the red fishing with me. Mm. The other, t they fish on the trout trips or they'll go to the church pond, the pond that I have behind the church here and go bass fishing with me for an hour after school one day or something like that. But they haven't really gotten into the red fishing. The youngest one, he likes the red fishing. And so he's probably the best caster of the three of them, but they really do enjoy fishing. But you know, one of them is going to play a college baseball, the oh, other wow. one senior in college. So he's just focusing on getting out sure. and getting a job. And then, so they've got the other things taking them in different directions. Oh yeah. The eighth grader, he's my little shadow hunting fish and that's another thing we we got a problem with the fact that duck season's about to start oh and right so, um we've got other 
other things we got to take care of, and that gets in the way of my red fishing. Yeah. So is it the same time? When is the prime time for duck hunting? Um, the duck season will start in November. Now we have an early teal season in September, uh, but duck season starts in November and October, November are some of the best months to redfish. Oh, All right. So there's overlap. I'm either preparing to hunt or actually hunting at a time when I should be catching redfish. And, um, uh, I just got too many hobbies and too many irons in the fire at times, but, um, you mentioned your trip to Alaska. That that really sounds like a really fun trip. Yeah, we're doing a little bit of an extreme uh, on this trip. Where uh, I mentioned Togiak Lodge, we are going to be heading up there, but we're also going to be driving up with the family. I'm gonna. I've got two girls. They're ten and twelve, and uh, and we're we're all going to drive. I'm going to get the camper on the back of the pickup, and we're going to drive uh, the Alaska Highway right all the way up just to do the. So that's going to be happening next year, and uh, and then. So it's pretty exciting for me. I'm the same way. I struggle sometimes to get my kids, you know, the same thing. I want them to do all this stuff, but, you know, we all have to work and, you know, it's one of those things. But this is the opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to have two or three weeks on the road together with the family. So that that's my big thing that we're going to be doing. Well, that's that's great. Uh, I, like I said, I've walked away from a whole lot of things to make sure that I was tried very hard to be a good dad. Yeah. Is that how it happened with the, because the FFF, you know, now FFI, I mean, it was huge and you were involved with it. I mean, wrote the book on it and you eventually kind of, would you say kind of left that? I mean, what does that mean? You know, you just weren't, um, maybe describe that a little bit. What was your take? You mentioned the conclave. I'm not even sure exactly how the conclave worked, but what was it like when you, you know, kind of left that area? Well, um, I was very, very involved with committee work on the board of governors. Uh, very much of that I'm very proud of, but I'll just, it, it sucked the fun out of life also. I mean, it was work that needed to be done. It was work that was very valuable and I'm very proud of the program, but it, um, the sausage making yeah. process and just take the fun out of things. Right. It happened to hit about the time you know, right about the time my oldest son was eight or nine years old, and I had two more coming behind him, and um, it was, was just time to be dad. And um, I really wish there was an FFF conclave to go to and let my kids meet some of these people and the people that meant so much to me. I mean, uh, Bruce Richards and, and um, you know, I, I really enjoyed learning from the Ray Jeff brothers. Both of them have a great deal in the past and i haven't seen chris Quartz and uh it's getting close to 35 40 years now um it just uh all those guys i'd love to introduce them to my kids and let my kids learn from them and yeah but that just doesn't exist anymore what, that what was that what what was the conclave or what, what was that exactly so when i was young in the, in the i it was long before me but when I came to it, it was the mid eighties in West Yellowstone. It was just a big convention and, uh, they had fly tires of all kinds, um, uh, in a big room where you could literally just go and sit in front of, uh, you know, the great fly tires. Dave Whitlock was there, Billy Munn, uh, Jimmy Nix. Those two guys really helped me a ton tying flies. And, um, you could walk around the room and visit with all of those guys. And then you go into the convention hall and every tackle manufacturer that, that existed had a, a booth there. So every rod manufacturer was there and it wasn't the sales rep standing there. It was Jim green standing in the stage. Yeah. But it was Steve Ray Jeff standing in the Loomis booth. Everybody who was anybody was there. And so someone like me who was from an area where there was nobody could go there and people were so helpful to people that, were, that acted like they were willing to learn. And I, my dad and I were able to just kind of soak that up. And my dad would always kind of push me out there as the, as the student, but he was listening to every word and had the ability to absorb it. And then he and I go back to the hotel at night and I literally take notes on some of the things that were said. Huh. Um, that just started to fade after a while. Um, and 
the last couple of the conclaves that I went to, they just weren't very well attended. And, you you know, so much available on the Internet. You know, why do I need to travel all the way to West Yellowstone, Montana, when I can just sit down with my computer and right. you know, somebody who claims to be an expert will tell me how to do it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Anyway, that's a part of the past that's kind of faded that I wish hadn't. That that was a really good, fun aspect of my life that I look forward to every year. And I got to meet so many cool people that way. That is awesome. Maybe they'll bring that back. It sounds like something... I mean, I, yeah, I mean, the power, I've been to, you know, a number of local or, you know, events and yeah, there's, there's nothing, you can't replace the in-person stuff, you know, just the talking, looking at the, you know, like that's part of the challenge these days, right? Because social media email as, as great as it is, it can make it challenging to actually have, I don't know, it's different, right? But, um, but yeah, so this is cool. Well, you're kind of out, are you still teaching, um, do you do any casting instruction, anything like that around fly casting? Very little. Um, now I don't turn anybody away if yeah. they want to come. My phone doesn't ring very often. Let's say it that way. Yeah. How would, how would they track you down if somebody wanted to get a fly casting? How would they track you down? Probably the best way is on Instagram. Okay. Uh, yeah, Bill exactly. Gamble Outdoors. Uh, they can probably message me through Facebook, and I check that about once or twice a month. You know, so I'm not a big Facebook person, but um, you know, those two probably be the best way to get me, but. I don't turn the lessons down. They just, the phone doesn't ring much and I don't promote it and don't push it. Uh, it's picked up a little bit here lately. Um, about two years ago, I found a, um, a group out of college station that was doing work that I really, um, wanted to get involved in. And, um, the group's called good fly hmm. and you've heard of project healing waters. Mm -hmm. Well, good fly was birthed out of COVID basically. And these men saw, um, uh, Steve Weaver and Alan King saw a need for first responders. They were still policemen. They were still doctors. They were still firemen in the middle of COVID. And they were starting to show signs of PTSD, just living through life. Well, they have started teaching fly casting to police officers and firemen and uh, nurses, really anybody in that first responder category. And so they'll go into a town and they'll have 20 people show up to learn to fly fish. And, um, well, you have 20 guys show up there. You need instructors. And so I've started volunteering with them. That's kind of, I've, tried to uh, lend what little bit of a name I have to it. And so they've had me do some speaking engagements and stuff like that to help promote that cause. And so that's gotten me out in the public a little bit more here lately. But uh, for the most part, um, uh, I teach all the casting lessons somebody asked for, and that's just not very many lately. Yeah. Gotcha. But I'd be glad to help anybody who contacts me, uh, whether it be over the phone, I've let me, let me finish with one little story, yeah. and I, this is a good way to wrap it up. Yeah. There was a young man. He and I have actually become pretty close buddies over the phone, but he was posting on the Internet, and he had a 100-foot-long measuring tape laid out in the park with a bunch of a little agility cones laid out, and that is code word for I'm trying to pass the casting instructor test <laughs> without actually saying it. And he posted that he had um, was struggling, had kind of reached a plateau at 65 feet for his distance cast. And he needed to get another 10 or 15 feet to really um, be where he needs to be to pass the first level of the test. Well, I, I messaged him and asked him if he had time for a phone call. And I um, taught him a little drill that found him the extra energy that he was wasting. Now, think about it. A grown man working hard to try to cast the fly as far as he can doesn't have the energy to go 65 feet. Hmm. He's losing some efficiency somewhere. Everybody has the power to cast 65 feet. Um, my 13-year-old can cast 65 feet. So he was losing energy. 
So I went back and I had him, I said, I want you to come into 20 feet, pull your line in the 20 feet. And I want you to cast as softly as you possibly can. And then I want you to put out 21 feet of fly line. And I want you to cast as softly as you possibly can. Make sure you're throwing a good loop. Make sure your loop is tight. But throw it as softly as you can. So soft that the rod doesn't bend. So soft that the loop doesn't turn over. Well, both of those are almost impossible to do. But they are good visuals. Yep. I want you from 20 out to 45 feet. One foot at a time. And then I want you to come in to 20 feet. And I want you to cast so softly it doesn't turn over. And before you add length of line, I want you to go out a little faster, 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 from here to here, faster, 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 and go so hard that you are literally, you know, cartoonishly fast, yeah. like a clown. Right. Your, your neighbors would make fun of you kind of thing. <sighs> go that hard, but don't mess up your loop. Well, in order to do that, you have to widen your arc for every time you add power, you have to widen that casting arc and your timing has to get faster because your pause needs to be shorter. If the lines, if the lines going through the air faster, your pause has to shorten. So you're working on all those variables. Well, then you do that one foot at a time from 20 all the way to 45 feet, slow to fast. And then I had to do it a third time, adding the double haul. Well, once you've done that drill three times, and it might take you two weeks to get through the drill, you have gone back and you have found all of that lost efficiency. Because now you can cast 45 feet so slow that the loop just barely stays in the air. Well, just a little bit faster than that is really all you need. But now you've cast so hard that you look like a clown out there in the yard casting that hard. And you've been able to keep that loop tight. Well, now it's nothing to go to 60, uh, excuse me, to 46 feet, to 47 feet, to 48 feet. It doesn't take much at all to just crawl on out. But you have the power and the, the, and the hand speed to do it. And you also have the variable stroke. Within two or three weeks, he had passed that CI test and was moving on to the next step. And, um, that drill really helped him a lot. And people ask me all the time, how do you shoot to a tarpon at a, you know, 65, 70 feet when you're standing there with just a leader in your hand? Yep. On the bow of the boat. Well, if you've done this drill, you've actually cast 20 feet of line as hard as you possibly can. Well, that's how you shoot uh, on the back cast and forward cast and you can actually work line out in two false casting cycles and make that 65 70 foot cast that you might need in a very short time because you have done this drill many saltwater guides they probably have never done the drill but that's what they're doing they are overpowering those short casts so that they shoot faster and they're able to get that distance out in a two false casting cycle that drill right there was a good way to sum up. Yeah. That one drill is worth listening to if, if they yeah. made it this far. Okay. No, I love that you ended on that drill. I think that does make a lot of sense and, you know, and, and that'll help a lot of people out. So this is great. Bill, well, I think today, you know, you've really covered everything. I think we're going to send everybody out. We mentioned it, Bill Gamble Outdoors on Instagram if they want to connect with you. And, um, yeah, just, just thanks, you know, again for all your time today and all the work you've done. I know a lot of people have mentioned you on the podcast and, you know, talked about your influence. You know, did you feel that way now that, you know, you looked up to Lefty and all those people back when you were a kid? Do you see yourself uh, feel that impact you've had on others? How does that feel for you? Well, I can see it. I feel it. Um, I guess I'm not around it much. I'm, I still live in Baytown, so I don't interact with a lot of fly fishermen. But Paul tells me about it. He's Paul will tell me that I'm more famous in Europe and <laughs> around the world than I am in, in, you know, the number of people that know me in America are very small, but these around the world, uh, the essentials has, uh, has just blown up and I, that just boggles my mind. I can't even imagine, um, what he's saying is true, but, um, yeah, the, the influence of men like Mel Krieger and Ray Jeff and Corich, those guys have just 
been invaluable in my life and um they don't even know it right they, they have no idea how much my father and i sat and talked about what they taught us in a in a 10 minute conversation they have no idea what that did um there was a sporting show in houston one day and we walked in and ray jeff was standing in the loomis booth and he had been there for like three days for this sports show and we walked in on the sunday and he just looked at my dad and said, I rod in the car. And he said, yeah. And he said, get me out of here. And we drove him to a park about two blocks down the road. And we stood there and cast. And he visited with my dad. And I would cast. And he'd make a little comment on, and a little um, extra help on my casting. And then he'd go back to talking to my dad. And um then I'd make a really good cast and I kind of look at him like I got it. And he'd step out there and he'd throw one a little bit further than mine. And, uh, we did this three or four times and I finally hit a really good cast and threw it out there a long way. Mm -hmm. He walked out there, took that rod and I've never seen the man come out of his shoes, but he threw one about 30 feet further than my best cast. And he handed me the rod and said, work on that for a while. I'm talking to your dad. <laughs> and, and so, he doesn't realize how much my dad and I, well, it was much more important to my dad because he, my dad just really enjoyed the conversation and, and really learned a lot from him. And then well, he was also helping me learn to cast, but, Yeah, you know, guys like that, they got no idea what they meant to my family. They knew us and they, they had, you know, glad to see us all the time, but they don't realize how much dad and I talked about them in the background and how um, we learned from those conversations and a lot of those conversations were actually on videotape. We got a lot of it uh, recorded. All right. I lost most of that in Harvey, um, the flood. Um, you know, so we could do another podcast on the stuff that, yeah, the, the fly fishing memorabilia I lost in this house. Oh man. Yeah. I've heard some of those stories. Well, we're going to definitely be following up with you and, um, and I'm going to hopefully have Chris Korich on and, and Steve Ray Jeff as well. In, in the future so um so cool all right bill we'll uh, stay tuned for all that and i appreciate again all your time today it's been awesome and looking forward to staying in touch thank you for your time i sure appreciate it the call to action today is to break down your cast and see how you're doing using the five essentials of fly casting check it out right now check out some of bill's videos uh, whatever you need to keep this rolling um, but let's keep this going so we can get you some more distance, some more accuracy, and some more love this year. Okay, our trip shout out right now, uh, the Alaska trip. Uh, if you're interested, you can check in right now. Send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com. Uh, and we have a spot available for Alaska. If you want to get on this, this is with Fishtown Expeditions. We're heading up to Alaska by road, so you're going to get a deal that is going to be pretty hard to refuse, a deal you can't refuse. Uh, check it out right now alaska giant rainbows it's happening uh check in with me all right that's all i got for you i hope you have a great evening i hope you have a great morning or great afternoon wherever you are in the country and i look forward to catching you on that next episode we'll talk to you soon <laughs>